today's video is brought to you by Established Titles. Rarely do I get to collaborate with a company that actually combines something that is equally fun while simultaneously serving a great purpose, and Established Titles is one of those companies that nails both down easily. Established titles are an ongoing project that allows you to buy land in Scotland and in turn, established titles plants a tree with every order. The overall goal of this project is to preserve the picturesque woodlands and biodiversity of Scotland. And to add the cherry on top, when purchasing a plot of land from Scotland, you are now officially a lord or lady. And I do mean officially. You can change your name to have Lord or Lady on credit cards, plane tickets, and each purchase gives you a frame certificate with an official crest and plot number. Even more, once obtaining your established title, you can go to their website and search for your own plot of land and view it from the comfort of your own home. And for me personally, what I think is the coolest feature is that if you use my unique code upon purchase, then established titles will put your plot of land right next to mine. Therefore, if enough people use my link at checkout, we can theoretically create a cadaver kingdom, and that in and of itself is worth the asking price. Established Titles is running a big sale right now, plus if you use code cadaver, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com forward slash cadaver to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Once again, use code cadaver at checkout to get an additional 10% off. Thanks again to Established Titles for supporting today's video. Forming friendships is one of the basic human needs. Friends can have a massive impact on one's mental health and happiness. A true friend is there to celebrate the good times with you and help you through those struggles. We bond with people over similar interests, outlooks, or taste and form amazing connections that make us thrive. Or, like in the case of Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski, friendships can also lead to a disaster. On the evening of Sunday, July 14th, 2019, a man named Charles Ray was driving along Highway 97 in British Columbia when he noticed a broken down vehicle on the side of the road. Charlie stopped to help, but the owners of the van, 23-year-old Australian Lucas Fowler and his 24-year-old American girlfriend, China Deese, only asked him to call a tow truck as he would be returning to an area with cell phone coverage. After Charlie's departure, several others stopped and offered help to Lucas and China, but the couple told everyone not to worry, saying everything was under control. Witnesses later explained that Lucas and China seemed calm and happy and seemed to even be enjoying life despite being stranded in the middle of nowhere. The couple was sure they would be back traveling the world in no time having no way of knowing that they had reached their last destination. At about 7 a.m. on the following day, on July 15th, a highway worker, Trevor Pierre, discovered the Chevy van still in the same spot, and 10 feet away from the vehicle were the bodies of both Lucas and China. Both had been shot multiple times, first on the back, indicating they were taken by surprise. The injuries were so severe that it took a few days to formally identify the bodies, and China's family were heartbreakingly told that an open casket funeral was out of the question. Lucas and China's murders puzzled the police as there were no signs of robbery or sexual assault or any other kind of apparent motive. Instead, it seemed like the couple had been murdered for no reason at all other than the act itself. That theory sent shivers through not only the community, but even the RCMP themselves. A killer who kills senselessly can target anyone, anywhere, at any time. Basically, the investigators had nothing else to work with other than the firearm evidence. Then, while the RCMP tried to make sense of Lucas and China's murder, another body would soon be discovered. Just four days after the first shooting, on July 19th, another highway worker found a burned out pickup truck south of Stickney River Bridge on Highway 37, 300 miles from where the bodies of Lucas and China were discovered. 
About one mile south of the vehicle lay the body of 64-year-old Leonard Dick, a botany professor from a Vancouver university. Leonard had also been shot to death, and the RCMP connected the murder quickly to the first shooting by comparing the cartridges found at the scenes. But strangely, when the officers investigated the burning Dodge pickup truck, they learned that it did not belong to Leonard. Instead, the vehicle was registered to a 19-year-old named Cam McLeod, and Leonard's Toyota RAV4 was gone. When the RCMP contacted Cam's family, they were told that he had left home on July 12th, apparently to look for work in the Yukon Territory with his longtime friend, 18-year-old Briar Schmigleski. At this point, the police had no idea on what happened to the two young men, and they were actually reported as missing persons. While the family members feared their sons had also fallen victim to these homicides, that fear changed to disbelief and horror when the RCMP learned that Cam and Briar may not have left home to hunt for a job, but instead to hunt for human beings. The news about Cam and Briar's disappearance spread fast, and people who knew them contacted the police with their concerns. Apparently, both young men had a dark side, and Briar was actually known to spend hours viewing disturbing material online and make posts on his social media accounts about Nazis and other extremist groups. Based on what they had heard, the police began to treat the two missing men as persons of interest rather than just missing persons. The suspicions were soon confirmed when the investigators searched what was left of the Dodge pickup truck and discovered ammunition inside of a charred metal container, the very same ammunition that had been used in the two shootings. As they continued digging, the RCMP learned that on the day Cam left home, he legally purchased a semi-automatic rifle at a Cabela store near Port Albany. Needless to say, both Cam and Briar were now the main suspects in the murders of Lucas Fowler, China Deese, and Leonard Dick, and a nationwide manhunt then ensued. The RCMP knew the pair had been traveling around with Leonard's RAV4, and as they appealed to the public for information, they began to receive tips on possible sightings of the vehicle. After connecting the dots, the police concluded both Cam and Briar had driven across British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. On July 22nd, the Toyota was seen in a remote town called Gillum and was actually stopped by police, but at the time, there was no way that the officers knew that the two young men inside of the vehicle would soon become murder suspects. The following day, the RAV4 was found near Fox Lake, north of Gillum, abandoned and set on fire. There were no signs of Cam or Briar anywhere, and the only way possible for them to escape appeared through the wilderness. Still, the whole idea that Cam and Briar voluntarily walked into those inhospitable woods seemed absurd. The reason I say this is because the forest in that area are incredibly dense and full of dangerous wild animals. Without some experience and proper equipment, running into those woods would essentially be a death wish. But perhaps that was the purpose. Due to the circumstances, the search party, which included an emergency response team, a crisis negotiation team, air services, and canine units, moved slowly into those woods. For days, they canvassed the dense forest and swampy terrain without any sign of the two boys. They did, however, eventually find clothing, identification, and more ammunition boxes. Despite tips coming in from people claiming Cam and Briar had been seen somewhere else, going as far as 125 miles away, the search focused on the remote area in Gillum. However, as time passed, the RCMP began to think about scaling back the search. But then, there was a breakthrough. After some items, including a sleeping bag, had been located on the edge of the Nelson River, the search continued, and on August 7th, Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski were finally found. Both Cam and Briar's bodies were located in a thick bush near the Nelson River. A subsequent autopsy confirmed that both Cam and Briar had died of self-inflicted gunshot wounds, but the exact time of death was impossible to determine.
There was also something even more chilling discovered next to the bodies, a video confession. Investigators recovered six recordings in which both Cam and Briar admitted to what they had done. They took sole responsibility for the three deaths and added that taking their own lives would be how their story would end. Disturbingly, the pair suggested that they had actually wanted to have a much higher victim count. Needless to say, the RCMP decided to never release these videos as they can influence or inspire other individuals to carry out similar acts. But there was one question both Cam and Briar chose not to give an answer to in these videos. And that was why. They did not explain the motives behind their crimes, nor how it all started. As far as we know, China Deese, Lucas Fowler, and Leonard Dick became targets purely by chance. It could have been anyone, at any time, who had the misfortune of running into Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski. For years, Canada's statistics of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls have looked devastating. The murder rate of Indigenous women is roughly 4.5 times higher than any other woman. And it is not the high number of victims that are disturbing, but the way in which these cases have been investigated in the past, and even today. When 21-year-old Lisa Young disappeared, her mother did her best to hide the fact that she was of First Nations ancestry, fearing neither the police nor the public would care to look for her daughter. Born in Nanaimo, British Columbia on May 5, 1981, Lisa was the first child of Joanne and Don Young, having two younger brothers, Brian and Robin. The Youngs were a close-knit family. Lisa would often call her father her best friend and saw her mother as a source of strength. Joanne's father, Moses Martin, was tribal chief of the Laokwiat First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Moses and Joanne both attended Kakawi Residential School on nearby Mears Island. These kinds of schools were created to isolate indigenous children from their own native culture and assimilate them into the dominant Canadian culture. Needless to say, the residential schools were filled with racism and abuse, and the experience left many children traumatized, which is why indigenous communities in Canada still struggle today with the negative effects of this system. Fortunately, Lisa herself was not affected directly by a residential school system and actually had a very happy childhood. From an early age, Lisa was known as a real girly girl who loved pretty clothing, painted nails, and anything that sparkled. She was described as a gentle and caring person who adored her younger brothers and always helped her mother look after them. Robin suffered from disabilities and Lisa was incredibly protective of him. Growing up, Lisa attended Breachin Elementary and Woodlands Secondary School. She enjoyed learning, loved sports, and participated in as many school activities as possible. Lisa was one of those youngsters that never remained still. She was forever busy, always having something to do. If she was not painting or writing, Lisa likely was out there with her friends, water skiing or dancing. Lisa grew up to be a very independent, confident, outgoing, and bubbly person who was the center of attention wherever she went. Lisa was someone everyone loved to be around. Despite her beauty and popularity, however, Lisa was never cocky, but genuinely cared about those around her. After her 21st birthday, Lisa began to make changes in her life. She had lived in the same apartment building as her parents with a roommate, but now Lisa planned to move into her own flat in northern Nanaimo. Lisa was also trying to leave the service industry after having a job at McDonald's and at a local nightclub for years, so she was able to locate a job at a call center while weighing what to do next. Lisa was unsure if she actually wanted to pursue higher education, but she did have dreams about becoming a sports broadcaster. 
In any case, Lisa was young and not in a hurry to go anywhere. She had her whole lifetime to decide what she wanted to do with her future, or so Lisa thought. On June 29, 2002, Lisa surprised her parents by informing them that she was going out that night to visit a local nightclub where one of her friends was having a birthday party. Joanne and Don both knew that Lisa had an incredibly busy schedule. The very next day, in fact, Lisa was actually supposed to move into her new apartment, and Don expressed his concerns about her not making it on time. But Lisa assured her parents everything was going to be just fine before leaving around 11 p.m. It was around midnight when Lisa and her friends arrived at the Jungle Nightclub. Lisa had worked at the nightclub for years, and it was a place she knew to the core and where she always felt comfortable. Lisa enjoyed her time having fun with her friends and meeting new people. Then, at about 2.30 in the morning, when the nightclub was about to close, Lisa and her friends encountered a 27-year-old man named Christopher Adair. Christopher asked if Lisa and her group of friends wanted to continue the night and offered them a ride to a house party in southern Nanaimo. Christopher seemed like a nice and friendly guy, so despite just meeting him, Lisa and her friends accepted the offer. The group remained at the first house party for a little while before heading to the other one in the Westwood Lake area of Nanaimo between 3 and 3.30 in the morning. Shortly after their arrival, Lisa began to feel hungry and she mentioned that she could not eat anything at the party because she was a vegetarian. Being a gentleman, Christopher offered to take Lisa to a nearby sandwich shop while her friends remained at the party. Again, Lisa agreed and the two got into his red Jaguar and drove away. Less than an hour later, Lisa's friend, Dallas Hooley, received a phone call that changed the mood of the night in the blink of an eye. The caller was Lisa, who told Dallas that instead of taking her somewhere to eat, Christopher drove her to yet another house party. Lisa said, Dallas, I don't know what's going on. This guy won't bring me back. We're sitting in a driveway on Bowen Road and he won't bring me back. I'm bored and I'm getting pissed off. While Lisa did not appear scared, she was definitely uncomfortable and soon began to question her safety because it felt like she was not allowed to leave this situation. At 4.30 a.m., Lisa sent a message to Dallas which read, Come get me. They won't let me leave. After that final text, nobody heard from Lisa again. Joanne and Don spent most of June 30th calling their daughter's cell phone, but Lisa did not answer. While such behavior was unusual, Joanne and Don thought that Lisa was simply too busy getting ready to move and that they would hear from her later that day. It wasn't until Lisa's roommate came looking for Lisa that Joanne and Don began to panic. Finding her daughter's black book, Joanne called every single number, but none of Lisa's friends had seen or heard from her since the night before. Having a feeling something terrible must have happened, Joanne and Don then contacted the police, who unsurprisingly did not take their concerns seriously. After all, Lisa was an adult, and only a few hours had passed since she had been partying with her friends. Perhaps she simply stayed the night with someone and was getting rid of a hangover. The officers advised both Joanne and Don to contact them again in 48 hours if Lisa was still missing, but Joanne refused to wait that long. Soon, a group of family members and Lisa's friends were searching for her all around the area, but their efforts were in vain. Later that evening, an officer ended up coming over to the house to get photos of Lisa, though he did tell them that he was off duty for the next four days, meaning there would be no progress before that. Frustrated by the lack of any progression, both Joanne and Don contacted the local news media and finally, somebody took Lisa's disappearance seriously. The following day, Lisa's story was all over the news. Shortly after, the RCMP dropped a bomb, informing Joanne and Don that their serious crime unit was now investigating Lisa's case. That was when Joanne and Don fully realized the seriousness of the situation. But still, even after all of this, the RCMP were not exactly rushing themselves with this investigation. 
It took authorities two months to identify the red jaguar Lisa was last seen in and bring Christopher Adair in for questioning. When the RCMP checked his background, they learned that this was not the first time Christopher was suspected of a crime. His rap sheet included charges for theft, assault, and fraud all throughout British Columbia. In addition, after Lisa's disappearance, Christopher actually assaulted a police officer in Saskatchewan. The more investigators learned, the more they felt certain that this man was responsible for whatever had happened to Lisa. But as there was no concrete evidence linking Christopher or anyone else to the disappearance, the RCMP needed a confession. Christopher was questioned by the police and he allegedly even spoke with Joanne, but nothing he said helped the investigation. Christopher claimed that he dropped Lisa off in the early hours of July 30th and that she planned on calling a taxi, even though phone records confirm that never happened. RCMP has not confirmed the following conversation, but allegedly Joanne asked Christopher if he could tell her where Lisa was, and he replied, I can't. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrespect your family. Christopher Adair was eventually released without charges. The Jaguar that was owned by Christopher's grandmother was forensically examined, but by the time police got their hands on that vehicle, it had been thoroughly cleaned. And to add even more problems to this case, the vehicle was actually sold very soon after Lisa's disappearance. Since then, the case of Lisa Young has been at a standstill. Her whereabouts and details of what happened to her are still unknown more than two decades later. Although there is little doubt that Lisa was abducted and murdered on the night she vanished, Joanne Young was determined to find her daughter. But sadly, she passed away on June 21st, 2017 from liver failure without any answers. Another tragedy struck less than a year later when on March 25th, 2018, Lisa's friend Dallas Hooley was walking along Highway 19A with a friend in the middle of the night when Dallas was struck by a vehicle and died five hours later. The next update came in June of 2021 when the RCMP held a news conference to provide an update on their investigation into Lisa's case stating that several witnesses who had been too scared to speak back in 2002 had come forward with their statements. But while the news sounded exciting, investigators are still missing key pieces of information that would crack this case wide open. Lisa Young's disappearance is one of those cases where the solution appears to be right in front of everyone. Lisa left the party with a guy she barely knew. She told Dallas that this guy would not let her go and only he walked out of the situation alive. But no matter how obvious these answers may seem, Lisa's fate may never be uncovered as long as secrets continue to be held that refuse to tell the truth about what happened that Saturday night. Depending on where you live, public transport can either be a boring everyday necessity or a living nightmare. Especially in the bigger cities, you can come face to face with any kind of situation imaginable. Somehow, public transportation tends to bring out the worst in people. But no matter how bad your worst experience has been while using a public transport, it's hopefully nowhere near what the passengers of Greyhound Bus 1170 experienced in Canada back in 2008. On July 30th at around 12 a.m., 22-year-old Tim McLean hopped on the bus number 1170, heading for Winnipeg after a long workday at a carnival in Alberta. Tim was exhausted. He sat down near the back of the bus, close to the bathroom, and closed his eyes falling asleep almost immediately. 
Tim, who was described as an outgoing and fun-loving guy, was excited to get back home to his girlfriend, Colleen, who was pregnant with their first child at the time. For hours, Tim slept without a care in the world while the bus traveled along the Trans-Canada Highway. At about 6 p.m., there was a stop in Erickson, Manitoba. That is where a tall Asian man named Vince Lee boarded the bus. Choosing a seat near the front of the bus, the journey continued for about an hour before a rest break was given to the passengers to possibly stretch their legs or even smoke a cigarette. Tim did just that. He got out of the bus and shared a cigarette with fellow passenger Cody Olmsted before returning to his seat. Within half an hour, all 36 passengers were back inside. At this point, for one reason or another, Vince decided to wander down the aisle and switch his seat in front of the bus to the one next to Tim. The 22-year-old greeted the stranger by nodding and smiling at him before resting his head back on the window and again closing his eyes. There was absolutely no reason for Tim to not feel calm and relaxed. He was sitting on a bus just a few hours away from home. What could possibly go wrong? While Tim slept, Vince sat next to him, appearing a bit fidgety and irate, but otherwise totally normal. That was until an hour later when he suddenly started chanting in Chinese and reached for his belongings in the overhead compartment, retrieving a large hunting knife. For a brief moment, Vince sat and admired the weapon, before plunging it totally unprovoked into Tim McLean's neck. A blood-curdling scream filled the bus and the other passengers turned to see what was happening. One of the witnesses later described that he saw a guy stabbing another guy with a big Rambo knife right in the throat. Meanwhile, Tim desperately tried to push his attacker away and jump over the seats to escape. But Vince was too strong and at this point, Tim's wounds were already so severe, the amount of blood loss made him powerless. As the shocked and screaming passengers ran towards the front of the bus, the driver pulled over and opened the doors to get everyone out. In the midst of his senseless attack, Vince noticed the escaping passengers and began walking after them, holding the knife in his hand. Fortunately, the driver was able to close the doors before Vince hurt anybody else. As chilling as it sounds, Tim was now all alone on the bus with his attacker. The sad truth is, with the severity of his attacks, there was virtually nothing that could be done to save him. Vince returned to his victims and continued to stab the 22-year-old 60 times in total. The witnesses would later describe that it was horrifying to see Vince's face and how he acted. He did not seem enraged at all, but more like a robot performing some brutal task. Shortly after, a truck driver named Chris Algier noticed the pulled over bus and saw the panicked passengers and decided to investigate what was going on. As soon as he was told someone was being stabbed, Chris grabbed a metal pipe from his truck and provided weapons to the other brave passengers. Together, they opened the door to the bus and shouted at Vince to drop the knife and step back from Tim's body. But it was like Vince was in another dimension somewhere out of reach as he continued mutilating the body of his victim. Only when three men took a few steps closer to Vince did he finally snap out of his trance and actually charged at them down the aisle. At this point, Chris and his fellow rescuers decided the risk was simply not worth it and instead of trying to fight Vince, they ran back outside and slammed the door shut. After staring at the people outside of the bus for a moment, with an expressionless face, Vince once again returned to Tim's body. While Vince's activities inside of the bus were out of the view of passengers, he made sure they saw the results. Once he stood up, Vince leaned towards the window and raised a hand. In that hand, he held Tim's severed head. One of the passengers later described the traumatizing moment by saying that some of the people were puking, some were crying, and some others were too shocked to do anything. The things that were happening inside of that Greyhound bus was not something that the human mind is designed to deal with. It was like the passengers had ended up in the middle of a nightmare or slasher movie, and yet somehow 
it was all real. Just after 8.30 p.m., the police finally arrived at the scene and tried to negotiate with Vince, which they quickly understood was not going to work as the only reply they got was, I have to stay on this bus forever. For hours, the officers could do nothing but watch Vince pace the length of the bus and then, just when everyone thought things couldn't get any worse, he began eating parts of Tim's body. Finally, on July 31st at 1.30 in the morning, the standoff ended as Vince broke the window in the back of the bus and actually tried to escape. He was tasered twice, handcuffed, and placed in the back of a police car. Officers then stepped inside of the bus to retrieve Tim's body. It was later found that his ear, nose, and tongue were found inside of plastic bags inside of Vince's pockets. Tim's eyes, however, and part of his heart remained missing, which likely meant that Vince had eaten them. After such a terrifying and unimaginable incident, everyone was asking what could drive a person to do something like this to another human being. While it did not make the situation any better, it was soon found out that Vince Lee was not a cold-blooded cannibalistic killer who enjoyed doing what he did but instead he was a man with a vicious illness. For all of his life, Vince had suffered with mental health issues to some degree, but things started to really spiral out of control in 2004 when he began to hear voices. Vince himself explained what he was going through by saying, the voice told me that I was the third story of the Bible, that I was like the second coming of Jesus, and that I was to save people from a space alien attack. Vince was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia, but it came too late to save the life of Tim McLean. When Vince sat next to the 22-year-old on the bus, the voices in his head ordered him to kill his fellow passenger, or he would die. In his mind, Vince saw Tim as an alien and believed that he was actually doing a favor for humanity by killing him. On March 3, 2009, Vince Lee pleaded not criminally responsible on account of a mental disorder. At this point, a psychiatrist had diagnosed him with schizophrenia, which was accepted by the judge, who sent Vince to a nearby medical health center, stating that he was not criminally responsible for the death of Tim McLean. After years of treatment, in 2016, Vince formally changed his name to Will Baker and announced that he wanted to live independently again. Vince's wish was granted in February of 2017 when the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board ordered Vince to be discharged. Today, Vince Lee, or Will Baker, lives as a free man. Needless to say, Vince's release has caused quite a bit of controversy. Nobody can deny that he was a deeply troubled person who suffered from terrible delusions and may never have killed if he received help early enough. But unfortunately, he didn't. And Tim McLean lost his life in the most brutal way imaginable. And his son lost his father before ever being born. In addition, many passengers and officials who saw what happened that day to Tim suffered from PTSD. And sadly, Corporal Ken Barker, the first officer on that bus, eventually took his own life in 2014. Still, the court has decided Vince does not pose any significant threat to the safety of the public, at least as long as he never forgets to take his medication.